All right, so it's internet homework time again. I've got my loose ends, and then I might tack on stuff I recorded before, but we'll see how this goes, how much time this eats up. Uh, first things first, if you like to read comments under my videos or community posts, just, just know that increasingly, the most interesting commenters and, and comment exchanges, you're going to have to go to sort by newest first, increasingly now. That's where my, my regulars are relegated. I don't know why, but I'm going to stop telling people individually to just comment from their non-regular channels or their, their backup channels, because it just really is that frequent now that on their regular channels, if it's a regular commenter of mine, it either goes invisible or you can only find it by sort by newest first. So instead of telling them to comment differently from different accounts, I'm just going to tell now at the top of the video. Um, if you're the type of person who, who checks comments in the first place, Odds are the far more interesting comments and comment exchanges are going to be if you do that filter. So sort by newest first. If you ever notice there seems a mismatch between the number of comments the comment thread says there are and then the number of comments you actually see, it's just because increasingly my regulars and my, my best regulars are just relegated to that for some reason. I don't think it's just in my kind of space that that happens. I think that happens to them in, in other spaces as well because this place sucks. So that's first announcement, but I've got a lot of little little bullet points here that I think I'm gonna to want to do rapid fire but I, I never know how that goes because I I say rapid fire but then I I hang on a thing for, for too long um, so I just got a first thing here do you agree that all movements in the gender world we can confine that to America or if you're familiar with gender movements outside of America right do you agree that all movements in the gender world are so bad as to not be worth identifying with or as to not be worth being labeled under. This is the, the first video I, I started. Uh, based men, no, no country for based men. In that video, I just want to say at the top, right? the first thing I made sure that I want to say is I don't identify in any which way. And I'm just wondering, after having heard me talk for, give or take, five hours over these last, last two uploads, uh, how many people are sold on that? How many people think that whatever the terminology is for self-identification in the gender world, every which position, every which ideological framework or movement comes up short and is not worth identifying with? And that's why we got to start from scratch in the way that I've tried to do, the way I've tried to do in this preliminary way. Start from scratch without identifying. Um, I think that something I've done that may seem like I am uh, more cheerleady toward the manosphere than toward their opposition, and I'm deliberately not naming their opposition, and that will be <laughs> that'll become clear when this is all when the trilogy is done. Um, I'm deliberately being more constructive, both because a uh, odds are that it's it's a lot more likely that a manospherian will stumble upon this than the sort of person that is in in this kind of ire way opposed to everything that the manospherians do. Uh, calling them uh, these spaces of male supremacy. Um, it's a lot more likely that the Manospherian will watch this than the sort of person who uses that kind of loaded rhetoric to describe them. But the second more important reason as to why I'm... It's not just that I seem more constructive. I, I really am more constructively critical of the Manosphere than, than of the, I guess we can call it the, the woman sphere. <laughs> it's because it has to do with patterns. When I do so in text inside the Manosphere, it's, it's not just that I have more success in terms of changing minds, but it's also the case that it's far less likely that I have one or another type of character assassination attempt run on me. It's very much a different story within the, the woman's fear when I attack one of the commonly spouted talking points or a core premise that is treasured within those spaces. Um, in the manosphere, it's not so much that I attack some of these core premises, but they have a lot of these talking points that I, I get somewhere with them when I point out that the talking points are just, it's just you guys heard someone, someone who's usually very popular, and then you're just repeating what you've heard without truly examining it. Two things is, the, the first thing is just this extra rancor for single moms. I don't think the statistics bear that out. There's a kind of lingering belief within the manosphere that single moms are the worst types of women or that they are um, worse than average in terms of entitlement. Unless you can actually point to a stat that has investigated this and found that that is actually the outcome, it is, it's just not going to jive with the experience of anyone who's been around the block for a while. Because 
it's a wake-up call to be a single mom. Whatever kind of bad choices that you want to believe preceded that, once that happens, and at least if the kid is a year old, a couple years old, that woman's no longer living on easy mode, especially compared to the type of easy mode that the pre-single mom or the woman who's not even going to end up being a single mom at any point is going to have that easy mode carry over. And one thing the Manosphere does point out is that easy mode does lead to a more blinkered outlook and a, a, a worse ability to reason about the world and to reason ideologically. But I just caught myself saying that you need to bring the stats, whereas I've got the, the anecdotal evidence to the contrary. So I'm saying that anyone who believes that the onus is on them. Uh, I, I do believe that because I do think they're making the extraordinary claim because this hard, medium, easy mode thing and just how predicted it is of how well a person is able to reason and their absolute level of entitlement. Um, it's not that I have plain direct evidence of example after example where she's less blinkered once she becomes a single mom, but someone I know who is very reliable, who has had many, let's call it uh, uh, womanly friendships and who's ran in a female social circle after female social circle after female social circle, uh, sh she's reliable, she's trustworthy, and she has assured me that if there's one thing her long history of female groups and friendships has taught her is that single moms aren't the worst types of women around. In fact, it's far from the truth. And that it, far more often than not, actually does build character regardless of what you want to believe about the bad decision that came before it. So anecdotally, though it's not really direct, it's one person removed from me who's very trustworthy and reliable who has assured me that that's one of the biggest blind spots within the manosphere. It's just their insistence, this extra rancor for the single mom. And yes, sometimes it's because they're very much using examples from the courtship world, the dating world. And some of these women are really brash and they put things in their, in their profiles that say that any, any, any real man will be willing to take on her kids and not raise a stink, not say a peep about the fact that somehow that diminishes her SMV and it does diminish her SMV and any realistic single mom will have, uh, will, will not take issue with that. That uh, a stranger, they're pretty much on, they're pretty much now in the courtship world, they're coming with kids, they're hoping to meet a stranger and they think that the fact that they've got these kids out of wedlock is going to be just a maybe even a positive point, but like a, a neutral point. It's like, no, 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 that is very much an example to the contrary. But not all single moms are like that. Some single moms, I would venture most single moms, understand that it's, it's far more a minus than it is a plus. It's, it's a cope to believe it's a plus. Um, but yeah, I have, I have reliable enough, I have a reliable enough surveyor that I know who has been in numerous social circles and one-on-one and -on -one friendships with women and this has been a, a, a kind of a constant. The most appalling women are usually not the single moms. Far from it. I'd like to see this talking point disappear from the manosphere because I think it, it really hurts them from a standpoint of just, just accuracy that they so unthinkingly buy into this, right? And I say that as someone who believes that no one's got any business bringing kids into the world, but I can still compose myself and actually look at the anecdotal, quasi-anecdotal evidence, but a direct or... or slightly less than direct to see that yeah that that certainly does does make sense um but then the other thing is the thing that like is this necessarily a a, a bad decision and that loops into the other kind of kind of disgusting talking point among the manosphere and that is that uh if she rides the carousel she's going to be stretched out if she's monogamous she's not going to be stretched out maybe they don't say the second part but it's always implied that the extent to which she's stretched out from the belt down in, in the nether regions. I don't know why I don't curse. I don't, I don't know why I don't use the most vulgar terminology because in certain moods I do, but I guess when it's early enough in the video, I'm kind of like, this is PG-13, <laughs> but it's not PG-13. This is very much going to be rated R. I just like to keep it PG-13 in the <laughs> early goings of the video. But anyone who's traversed the manosphere will know that there is this insistence that it's truly disgusting once she's stretched out, and it is because she's written the carousel, but you've got to be mindful of the fact that at least some of the time, it could be the result of a long-term relationship. Let's say that she gets her first boyfriend at, at, at 16, 
and she's with him for a decade, and they fuck like rabbits, they break up, and he's well hung. He's, let's say, above average or maybe in the, in the top tier in terms of his size. That she, she's going to be stretched out more despite having been in a decade-long monogamous relationship because her partner is above average sized. Uh, compared to a woman who, who rides the carousel, who is excessively promiscuous, but who, for, for one reason or another, she's just never been with a partner anywhere near the size of the, the woman with the long-term partner who's hung like a horse, right? And so I just want Manosphereans to, to the extent that they care at all about being persuasive, to watch out for these kinds of talking points and to not accept them criti uh, uncritically just because the people who deliver those points are comedically talented or talented in some other way are, are charismatic and their charisma makes it seem like it's just such an obvious truth that the, the stretched out woman is going to be the whore no in some cases the, the stretched out woman is just going to be the woman who's been, been with a partner who's who's hung like a horse and i, I just, i've just never seen manosphereans actually get a little self-critical about these sorts of things that make just they just make the rounds in the manosphere and the manosphere has so much good things good critical things that no other media space. No media space at all brings to the forefront. I don't want to see them lose credibility because of these flimsy oversights. So those are those are two examples. There's there's more examples, but I'm just gonna move on and go point by point here. Uh, drag queen story time. So this touches on gender in a way that I don't think anyone has really connected, but we know that in America uh, for especially red state media, throwing meat to the base is often very much the at the top of the list is this exposure of drag queen story time. It does happen. There are drag queens that get invited to classrooms. I don't know if it's as early as, as kindergarten, but certainly in the early stages of the elementary, first, second, third grade, something like that. And this makes the very people who are predisposed to tune into red state media and red state media only, this just makes them foam at the mouth because it's supposedly depraved. Sometimes QAnon will get in on this and will try to connect it to all the other you know, kind of Epstein conspiracy fetishists. And they'll say, well, this is where it starts. It starts with a drag queen story time. But I think you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. And oftentimes, they don't connect it to like the the island, the island where all the poor kids are being sacrificed um, sexually to all these depraved celebrities and, and, and politicians. You don't have to go that far. I think the average person who's foaming at the mouth at the fact that there is such a thing as drag queen story time, exposed to very young and impressionable kids. Um, I, I just think it's the fact that they think that this is visually repulsive and they don't want their young kids, especially their young boys, they don't want implanting any sort of ideas in their heads that uh, this is how any man can possibly be and possibly be tolerated, right? Because the classroom gets you to not just visually become accustomed to the idea that a man can dress extravagantly, but that this is something that society tolerates. Right? So we don't need to take it to the child ring sexploitation, absurd extrapolations, right? Because I really think that that's the minority of the backlash. The majority of the backlash is just that, like, I don't want my child seeing a man treated normally who's extravagant, right? Now, maybe a good number of those people who are non-conspiratorial, who are just paying attention to what happens in the classroom and not extrapolating it, maybe a good number of those people would also have the same intense negative reaction if it's an extremely extravagant woman dressed in the same way, reading story time to really young, impressionable kids. Maybe they would, but I doubt it. I very much doubt it. I just think the fact that these people react the way they do, it just has to do with the fact that they think that it is not, no, no one has any business putting into their kids' minds that men get to be anywhere near as self-indulgent in their attire in the manner they speak, in their interests, uh, as women do, right? So it's just so amazing the kind of pushback that we get to red state media that I see here. It's just couched along the lines of, well, they're bigoted toward the drag queens, but they'll never use a word like misandry to identify the root of the problem because the root of the problem absolutely is misandry. Like if you're not actually fearing that 
your child is going to be assaulted or abducted by the drag queen. You just don't want your child to even have notionally any kind of awareness that this is something that some men are into uh, and that they have a right to be into and that you don't have a right to shame them or at least you don't have a right to think that you are reasonable in shaming them. You're not justified, I should have said, in thinking yourself reasonable for, for shaming them unless you also believe that women ought to be shamed to an equal degree. Uh, it, it, it's just rank misentry. So it's just, just another example. The backlash, the explosive backlash to something like drag queen story time across red America, far more than blue America. And yet at the same time, I'm being told that it's, it's red America that's always going to go to bat for men. Well, they're going to go to bat for kind of conventional Borgish men, but they're not going to go to bat for men qua men. Because they're always going to be, just as I went into it in length in the first installment of the gender trilogy just as, just as they're always going to have these oversights along the lines of stuff like uh, sizeism because they are the gendered serfs they are self-avowed gendered serfs likewise we see that crop up in the context of drag queen story time they cannot begin to think about this critically and I'm I am sure that if it were just purely women dressed as extravagantly being as um, uh, mindless, there is a kind of mindlessness in, in the presentation and just in, in the tenor. I agree with that. But what makes these people's heads explode? It's not those stylistic things, per se. If it were purely the stylistic aspects of the self-presentation, then it would be equally charged. The backlash would be equally charged whether or not it's a drag queen. If it's an actual kind of uh, uh, a baby doll or, or, or Barbie doll or this this phenomenon of, of Barbie core now. Like if those kinds of women went and read stories to young kids, young impressionable kids, I don't think the backlash would be one-tenth of what it is. No, no. It's just the fact that these people want men to not have the kind of cultural currency to be anywhere near in as self-indulgent as they are okay with women being. Uh, but if a man is just wired to be self-indulgent and extravagant in all these kinds of ways that start from attire or their tone or any, any other kind of self-presentation and, and their self-schema, um, it can't be a double standard there, <laughs> and it, it, it very much is. So you are a hollow profit for male interest, or at least a partial profit for male interest, if you just uncritically accept this kind of double standard. Um, for those of you who are of the view that this should never be taken into the classroom, and who would also apply it every bit as much to uh, self-indulgent, extravagant, baby dolls. <laughs> um, fair enough, we can debate that on those different kinds of grounds. But if you actually want to think that you're going to be able to reasonably, on any kind of reasonable grounds, get away with a double standard, uh, you are exactly the target of the five plus hours I've uploaded so far in those first two gender installment videos. So I advise you to, to listen to all that before we, we get into this. And, and especially listen to that second half of the last video where I get into big chivalry. Because big chivalry is something that contributes to these kinds of oversights. Where you're just so viscerally appalled by the idea that a man is going to be wired and entitled to behave in accordance to the way he's wired. And that this is something that we should present to children as perfectly normal. That appalls you, but the exact same thing for women doesn't appall you at all. Then you, you are the prime target of the sort of thing that I'm, I'm doing with this whole gender trilogy stuff. Um, and, and I think you're, a, you, you're even a worse enemy to long-term male interests and to male psychological health than the worst kind of gynocrat and matriarchal mandingo, <laughs> and, and certainly the, the, the women who pull, their, who, who pull on them through their puppet strings, through their sexually induced puppet string tools. Moving on. Um, Pedos. Yeah, so this does get into the pedo thing. Um, there's a lot of misandry on this as well, and the character assassination is very ripe. Um, I don't even care if it's 99% of pedos who would, if they could, commit the act, do or would, if they could, commit any kind of act, the, the worst of which would be child molestation, then a bit lower than that is just diddling, and then just even circulating the, the, the child pornography online. 
uh, even if it's as much as 99% of people who are, in terms of their sexual orientation, pedophilic, I think it's less than 99%, but even if it is 99%, if 1% are appalled by their sexual orientation and would never dream of doing any of these things on the spectrum, the top being child molestation, the bottom being circulating child pornography online, contributing to it a la demand, if, if as few as 1% wouldn't dream of doing it and are appalled with their orientation and would change it if they could. That itself is a reason to stop using a word like pedophile and to zero in on the actual acts and the actual misdeeds, a la child molester, a la diddler, and so on and so forth. 5 a.m. and I'm dealing with sirens. Um, but see, this is yet another. It, it so mirrors so many of the other things that I've complained about with the last couple of videos. Oh, fuck off already, Jesus! I can't, I can't concentrate with the stupid siren. It mirrors it in the sense that there are many people who surely know that this is a sensible point and who surely, part of their minds, a part of them is motivated to actually make this sort of point but who won't because it's just not worth the hassle. It's just not worth the hassle because what's going to happen is the assumption is going to be that, oh, well, why is that person at all energized about the, the, the plight of the 1% pedophiles who are not... like? See, it's always going to be assumed that you have some skeletons in the closet. I don't know whether I want to leave the siren spaz out in. I, I spazzed out the siren and I watched it back and it's amusing enough, so I'm actually thinking I want to leave it in, but if I watch it a second time and I find, and find that it's not nowhere near as amusing, then I'll, I'll cut it out. But uh, there was something I said right after that, so in case I did end up cutting it out and you're watching this, I need to uh, make that point again. I think that point had to do with how ripe character assassination is on this topic. If you simply make the recognition that the immoral thing here is child rape, child molestation, circulating child, uh, online pornography, De contributing to its to its demand that's the issue here pedophilia per se it is unchosen and so the pedophile is not synonymous with any of these these other things and it's just such a uncontroversial thing to recognize and yet you got to know that the vast majority of intellectuals who are let's say I I who who believe in impartialism and who believe that um uh, conduct rules a roost, not any kind of inner inner trait. Who believe that uh, various kinds of people who have what clearly is uh, one or another type of psychopathology, uh, to the extent that they don't act it out in the world, and to the extent that they're not motivated to act it out in the world, and think it justified, but don't simply because they fear legal repercussions, but who are nonetheless saddled with the psychopathology, right? There's a lot of intellectuals who talk this way, but then when it comes to pedophilia, like, they won't touch it. It's too risky for them. And we know why. And it often loops into these other uh, uh, male, male adversity-style things, right? It's because the, peop the, the person who shows that they understand that the misdeed is separate from the orientation, here the orientation being pedophilia, the moment you just simply recognize that these are two very different things, non-overlapping things, even if it's as low as 1% of pedophiles who don't think themselves entitled to diddle or, or molest or rape children or circulate child pornography, even if it's as low as 1%, that still leaves them being pedophiles in terms of their sexual orientation. And it's just so obvious. It's just so... There's, there's nothing counterintuitive about the possibility of a pedophile being mortified by his sexual orientation that's irreversible. Um, and yet so many people haven't just made this point. You would have thought that, you know, if they're on the internet commenting on various things, all sorts of, they, they think they're hitting third rail issues, they think they're being controversial because they're, they're what? They're pushing back on wokeism and they think that, oh, we're too, we're too hot for the internet, we're being canceled. No, no, no. To be too hot for the internet is to make the sort of point I just made because what that is, is it's not just that you're going to end up being deplatformed or something like that. No, no, you're going to have the worst kind of assumptions made about you. If you go to bat for that minority, maybe it's not a minority, but here I'm just for the sake of the argument, 
I just relegated it to 1%, let's just say it's as low as 1% of pedophiles who don't intend to harm children in any single way and who would um, do a wave, they could with a wave of a magic wand, their sexual orientation, but they can't, thus they're still pedophiles. There's no reason to treat those people like the scum of the earth, right? And see, so many of these other issues that I'm raising that have nothing to do with pedophilia, but that, that are these male-only issues, just as with the pedophilic case, people won't go to bat for them because they fear that then they're going to, assumptions will be made about them, that they've got pedophilic skeletons in their closet. The same, the very same thing can be said uh, for all the, for, for so many of these uh, male-only adversity style issues. You're just going to be assumed to be the spokesman for first personal reasons. You're the spokesman, you're trying to get people to be a little more reasonable about it because you have some kind of scurvy motive. And so, you, if you're watching that, I just want to know, like, if you had a large platform, would you have the courage to make the sort of uncontroversial point that I just made and reach the sort of obviously reasonable conclusions that I just reached on the 1% pedophile example case? Um, or do you think that having a large platform would be too much trouble and not worth it because you fear having those kinds of assumptions not just be made, but then be convincing to the vast majority of people, right? Or would you advise me, if I had a larger platform, would you advise me against just putting two and two together on pedophilia, on, on any of these other numerous uh, male-only or, or predominantly male issues? I want to know this about my viewership, or at least about my, my commenters. Where you guys stand in terms of thinking how far is, is too far, and how far is too far from a standpoint of becoming a, a, a pariah that doesn't just get affected financially, but also maybe just being like a, a complete a complete castaway as a result of it? Because I'm at a point right now where is, there, there, is no, there is no such thing as too far. If it's reasonable, I'm going to go there. And all I'm interested in is a counter-argument that argues the issue itself, not the sort of character assassination attempt or, or any other kind of um, assumption about the, the, the spokesperson, the spokesperson's essence. Um, and, and the reason I'm so stuck on this is because we've never had, the internet has never had this many people who treat themselves as iconoclasts or at least something in the way of edgelords, but who I think are reasonable enough to understand that this point I just made makes sense, but who would not in a million years dare to make one such point. Because we've seen other people who don't go quite as far as this, who may say something that is half as conciliatory to that hypothetical 1% of pedophiles who are appalled by their own orientation. And even if you're as half as conciliatory and understanding of their plight, the position they're in, it's still too much. It's still, there's still gonna be enough headlines, again, usually red state media, that'll say something like, oh, another another progressive trying to normalize pedophilia, these kinds of shortcuts. Obviously, there's a difference between people who try to normalize pedophilia, which is morally reprehensible, and the sort of people who just simply display understanding. And I think that this is, especially for any kind of male living in the West who is heterosexual, cishet, and who has to traverse these courtship hell holes Suddenly you're going to find that it's, it's very easy to see that, oh crap, yeah, my sexual orientation is just burdensome. And then that can be a kind of foot in the door to empathizing with all these truly depraved sexual orientations. It's, 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 it's not that much of a stretch. This is why the manosphere is so eye-opening to so many people. It's because it's, in no other online space will guys bemoan their sexual orientations. Usually it's in the subsection of the manosphere known as the incel sphere, but it makes its way into other, it even makes its way into the seduction community, right? Because the seduction community doesn't just have adherents, the seduction community sees its share of critics. It's not like all these subsections of the manosphere, like they all keep into their own lane and they don't cross-pollinate and, and, and debate each other. So yeah, that was just the thing, I just, it's just sad. It's so sad that so few people have the courage to make this uncontroversial point about the fact that, yeah, there's some lot of pedophiles who must be mortified at the, the position they find themselves in. And the reason they don't is because they don't want thinking, oh, 
oh, they're going to think that I'm a pedophile because I just simply put two and two together. That's as far as it goes for most people. They're just that reputationally owned because they're, like I said in the last video, they are social agents before they are moral agents. And even some of the most high-minded people uh, from, from academia who should have been far more than, uh, who should have made far more than this one sort of comment, um, they're, they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. And that's okay, but then you can't, you can't treat yourself as the thinker outside the box, right? You may be willing to think outside the box, or at least one box, but there's numerous boxes you can think of, think outside of. Um, but it's one thing to think outside the box, it's quite another to speak outside the box once you've jumped out of as many boxes as, as I have. Right? And so we should respect people who speak outside multiple boxes. And people who don't, we should just, well, we can't boycott them because they're unboycottable, because that's because they're calculated, right? Um, but yeah, I'd like to see the tide turn, and so just a little, little bit of a kind of. I'm doing an on again, off again Q and A throughout this video. Like, how many of you would, if you find yourself with a large platform, make a sort of what really should be a, a uncontentious point about this? You know, any kind of sexual orientation per se should not get you castigated from society. It should only be your misdeeds. How many of you would make one such simplistic point? Knowing that the avalanche will come and that the avalanche, the character assassin, assassination avalanche will be persuasive. Interested to know. Um, okay, so this is something Black Mind keeps saying that I actually want to um, probe. So he, he keeps saying that most men have been too easy and that's why women in the West are <laughs> walking nightmares they are. He thinks it's a larger than probable number of women who he would ca categorize that way. Uh, I have sympathy for him because he's had to deal with, with the, 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 black, the black women, the hyenas as he puts them, as he refers to them. But here I just wrote this. Do we really know that most men have been too easy? Uh, certainly I think at minimum somewhere between 20 and 25 percent men have been. So even if it's as low as just the, the bottom quintile of men or the, or the bottom quarter of men who are doing it, it's enough to have an outsized effect. Hell, I think if, if they are especially simpish, like turbo level simpish and or orbitish, it can have an outsized effect, even if it's as low as 10% of men. Uh, if truly they do devote that much time to essentially... Um, salivating anytime an attractive woman is in their proximity and kind of salivating on her um, because you got to just just reverse the roles in that and just think about it. what ha what would happen to the kind of typical guy's mindset if every tenth woman he comes across or every fifth woman he comes across uh, displays that level of salivation to him as um, I'm speculating now 10% 20% maybe 25% of men do uh, so, so certainly in the West so, since I brought up Black Mind for consecutive videos now, I'll just bring him up here again because one of his recurring things that he points out is that the only thing men should be blamed for over the fact that there is a gender war is that, as he puts it, uh, we have been too easy. But I think that's too quick. It's not at all clear that it's been some larger than one-fifth or, or at, at most 25%. Uh, I, I really don't think it's at all clear that it's been that much. It's just it can have an outsized effect if the minority of men who conduct themselves that way just do it often enough and pathetically enough. That can, um, what's the term? One rotten apple can spoil the whole pot, something like that. Yeah, that might be applicable to, to this here. And I just think it's important to, um, since I've said that black mind is, is paranoid, in certain areas, I think this is another one of the things that I need to kind of cover is that he assumes, I think, just the typical guy has been too easy. I don't know if that's true. I think it's just enough. Maybe in relationships it's true. The typical guy has been too easy, um, but not in terms of just recreationally. So, yeah, that's a 
I'm, I'm just actually thinking this out loud right now. I'm thinking through this right now. Yeah, it is possible that it's more than 20 or even 25% when we think about being easy in relationships. But then I would highly doubt if it's over 20% when it comes to just recreationally, outside of relationships. Salivation style easiness. So I used Black Anoya in the last video when I referenced his... He certainly is racially paranoid. Black Mind is because he thinks... He uses terms like Masta or, or Massa. Unironically, he thinks hatred of blacks is just so rampant and widespread across the Anglosphere. Um, and certainly embedded into the fabric of institutions, however subtly or unsubtly embedded. Um, so I use Black Anoya for that. Some of that spills over to gendered paranoia as well, even though I do have these, you know, speculations about maybe more than 50% of black women being hybristophilic. Um, hard to know these numbers. Um, and then there might be one final form of paranoia, and, and maybe paranoia is the wrong word for it, but this assumption, which certainly here, any, every other video he says, though the one thing I'll blame men is for being too easy, but maybe that's too quick. Maybe it's just in the context of relationships that there's a non-negligible number of men, but in terms of just day-to-day -day on the street, or, or the, the reason something like OnlyFans can even exist as being equivalent to on the street, uh, it's just these simpish forms of, of too easy. Um, though I don't want to make it seem like 20% is, is negligible and anything above 20% is non-negligible. Really, when it's something as sexually dystopic as only, OnlyFans, then... Um, you know, even anything above 1% men who contribute to it, that's enough for it to be uh, beyond negligible, post-negligible. Post um, but so yes, he is, he is black annoyed, he is a bit paranoid, but he is on to something because I'm not going to completely discount his own personal experiences. And I think they, you know, there's all this, you know, men need to talk about their personal experiences, but then any time they do and it's inconvenient, they just throw pies in their faces. That's what would happen to Black Mind if his channel went viral. He would just get a bunch of pies thrown in his face. So the people who are these pie throwers, then they should at least point out that, well, we encourage men to speak honestly and openly about their experiences, but if those experiences speak to something that's inconvenient for us, uh, we're might as well going to tell them that they shouldn't have done that because we'll throw the pies in their face. But even though there's... It's not just him who is paranoid. There's there's other Manosphereans who probably are to that level paranoid. I am willing to be easier on Manosphereans for their paranoia because so many mainline commentators think that male disposability is a relic of the past because we live in civil society or, or, or deep society, as I'm going to put it. It's We're a deep society. Um, and male disposability is just something that was around in the ancestral environment. But in any kind of non-physically combative environment, or physically uncombative environment, there is no such thing as male disposability. And to, to, fully, to fully explain why there is, that's a separate video. And it may be a video that I'll just write out my case in favor of why, and I'll just read it out, because it needs to be a, a more compact snappy argument than the t kind of arguments I'm making here because it's a very important point to say that male disposability is still very much uh, I don't know if it's as bad as it would be in the ancestral environment but a lot of indicators statistic just statistically speaking is that we we tolerate male disposability and male expendability um, and so that's why like when I look at the the paranoia in the manosphere prime example being black mind this assumption that a larger, that a larger than probable number of women are this Machiavellian <laughs> and sadistic. Um, yes, it'd be better if they truly thought about how difficult it is to know these sorts of things, just like how difficult it is to know the sorts of things that I'm asking right here. It's like, what percent of men are the problem in terms of this simping? And not even simping by proxy, but just like simp simping, the way it's typically understood. These are all very hard things to know statistically because no one's interested enough to measure these things, to investigate these things. Um, but the reason I cut slack to the Manosphereans who are, who are paranoid, who are making these assumptions, is because everyone does... Everyone that they've grown up listening to, it's so clear that the issue of male disposability 
those kinds of people who gave them the pep talks didn't really bring male disposability into the sort of story that they wanted to tell. And so when you, when you, when you grow up and when you have to find out on your own that actually, no, no, it very much is still with us, that can cause a lack of, a, a loss in trust in your typical uh, gender therapist or other kinds of therapist. Like men always, you know, one of the things that's just told here is men need to go to therapy, but, but, but therapy is one of the most gynocentric kind of, therapy catapults you into one of the most gynocentric environments that I think you're gonna ever come across. And I'll try to retrace my steps and link to men who have been in therapy, who are now within the manosphere, who give their honest to God, who share their honest to God experiences, and who didn't even have the terminology at the time they were in therapy to know what kind of things there was, what kind of a mindset was being inculcated in them. Um, but it is because of those things that actually, I don't want to be as rough on the manosphere for their paranoia. And then there's other reasons to be paranoid, like for example, the very people who claim to want to be helpful to everyone and inclusive. Uh, those are the very kind of people who get hired and, and who make waves in, in big tech and I'm sure who are responsible for the fact that my Apple newsfeed algorithm, uh, it, not, not, uh, even algorithm is the wrong, just the, the, the way the search tool operates, not necessarily have to do with algorithm, but just what is traceable and not traceable within, if you do a search on it, if you have it on your phone, you know, I just have it in terms of morbid curiosity, but I can I can see why guys would end up paranoid and assume more, assume things in worse kinds of ways than even I'm kind of going over in in this video. Like, I'm sure to the average person who's sound asleep on all these issues, I'm going to come across paranoid when I say that there's there's a war on men and not the sort of war on men that Tucker Carlson will teleprompt his way through when he tries to explain it. No, I'm talking about the war on men in more in-depth ways than stupid crap that's on par with like the war on Christmas. No, no, th there is a... Okay, anyway, so I'm, I started talking about the Apple Newsfeed algorithm. So, not the algorithm, but just the search tool. I understand a guy who finds out what I found out about it. You search for misogyny, you just end up with just endless results and of course always condemnatory of misogyny. Uh, you search for misandry, handful of results. Uh, the title that you get from the pieces that come up, they don't even have misandry in the title. The one that did is the one that points to that book called I Hate Men that I screenshotted and I utilized as one of the visuals for the video, uh, for, the, for the first uh, gendered video that was in. And if you watch that video instead of just listening to it, you'll know what book I'm talking about because I, I, I visually incorporated it into that video, right? That's what comes up when you type in misandry into this putrid Apple News uh, app that I haven't deleted yet because again, I want, it's, it's, it's good as evidence because there's other kinds of lopsided search results that come up. It just so shows that they're, they're so, they're, they're, they feel so safe in their propaganda tactics. Because think about it, if you felt that you weren't in the driver's seat, this kind of weeding of the results, misandry, they never have to say misandry is a non-problem, right? All they have to do is disentangle the results such that uh, the, the only actual misandry related article that comes up is an article that gives glowing coverage to a woman who authored a book that essentially argues in favor of misandry. That's the one thing you get, whereas you search misogyny, just, just endless results. And endless results of the typical kind of pieces that you would expect of the sort of people who would exclude all the misandry related posts or um, even just, just kind of spaces that discuss misandry in critical ways. You're not going to find that out if you have the sort of Apple News app that I do. There's other examples of this, but it's just the, the best one and the most glaring one is this slopsidedness in terms of what comes up when you search misogyny, what comes up when you search misandry. It just so shows that like a careful propagandist would not make it that clear. A careful propagandist, oh, right, there's another one. 
Uh, bimbo, nothing. No results. Zero. Himbo, like a daft male. Oh, you bet your ass the results come up for that. Obviously, that's less serious than the misandry misogyny one, but I just remembered it now, so I just, I just had to throw it in. But the point is, a, a cautious propagandist will not make it that clear. Maybe they'll filter results so they'd be kind of 70-30, 70% critical pieces on misandry, only 30% on critical pieces on mis um, misandry. Did I say that right? 70% critical pieces on misogyny, but only 30% on misandry. But it's not even that just one critical piece on misandry came up. The one misandry related piece that came up was an article plugging favorably, uncritically, that book, I Hate Men, by that French feminist who, thankfully, I forgot her name. I shouldn't utter her name. Her name doesn't deserve to be uttered in this video, but she just unironically writes this book. I've read reviews of it. I haven't read it. But it's, it's the sort of book, I'm just going to tell you guys, like, if you ever find a chick reading that book or, or any books of that genre and they're either nodding along to it, you, you catch some sort of positive reaction to that book. And they don't even have to think it, they don't even have to have any sort of serious engagement with one such book. They just have to go as far as to think that maybe it's, it's funny or it's cute. That a book like that gets written, they just think it's, yeah, it's just, it's charming in some way. Maybe they don't take it seriously, but it's still a charming kind of book, and it's just something to, it's just something to buy and to support. Um, because, again, male adversity is, we're hardwired to find it funny, and so maybe even a, a woman who wouldn't sign off with all the things in that book, or, or any of the things in that book on a serious way, still thinks that that's the sort of book that can be engaged uncritically, because it's funny, right? So, so if, if you have anyone in your life, or not, not even in your life, let's just say that uh, uh, yesterday you're out and about and you spot a woman in public reading that book, nodding along to it, or just smirking along to it, uh, and let's just say she, she's, she's a knockout, right? And then just inexplicably the next day she's, she's pounding on your door, begging, begging to get a little, <laughs> begging to get some from you, right? The only re I don't even care if you're on a dry spell or anything like that. The, the only sensible reaction for you as a man who understands that misandry is bad, just like any of the other prejudicial attitudes and uh, beliefs are, are, are bad, um, I don't care how much she's begging for it, I don't care how much of a dry spell you're on, and I don't care how much of a knockout she is, if it's the woman you caught the previous day reading one such book and being enthralled by it, Really, the, the only thing to say, the only thing to say in any such circumstances. And she's begging for it. She's, she's begging for it, and it's you and no one else. But she read one such book. The only thing to say is, I, I wouldn't piss in your mouth if you paid me. <laughs> Nothing short of that suffices. It should go without saying, though, having watched this back now several days later, I got, I got very punchy toward the end there. Uh, so I just want to make it clear that should go without saying, but I'll make it clear anyway. Uh, it, it applies every bit as much when the case is, when the situation is reversed, and it's some overt misogynist or someone who maybe doesn't display any act of misogyny, but a little subtle cue uh, or one of these signals, and then he ends up pounding on the chick's door and, and begging for it from her, and she saw him the previous day, right? So it's, if it's a replica case, but the genders are reversed, I would give the same advice to a similarly situated woman who's on a dry spell or something of that sort, where it's uh, also the offender is a kind of similarly situated male, as just the flip side of what I just lost um, before I, before that section cut off. Um, I said a few other things, but those things don't fit because I didn't qualify it in this way by saying that it should apply every bit as much. Uh, the reason I'm just so much more eager to point out the case where it's a woman reading the type of book that is I Hate Men, written by that baddie feminist from, from France, um, is, is because it's just so much more in, in the world as it actually exists. It's guys who need to hear this kind of advice, because guys are the ones who have a scarcity mindset as it relates to sex and just companionship and all these things that loop ultimately into sex and intimacy. Uh, just the vast majority of guys have a scarcity mindset, whereas the vast majority of women have an abundance mindset when it comes to dick. So, 
you can see why I am only days later after having watched this now realizing that it's it's unfair if I paint a picture but then I don't point out that it's also every bit as applicable when it's a, a chick who has a, a misogynist who the misogynist doesn't see that she saw him reading some misogynistic book the previous day but then he's begging for it from her um, it, it goes without saying that she should also decline him even if she's on a dry spell it's just that this is far less likely to eventuate given the world as it actually is especially across the West where um, she even if she's on a, on a dry spell she's, she's not gonna have a scarcity mindset as it relates to the opposite sex as is gonna be the case when it comes to a guy um, who, who lacks the abundance mindset that, that even women who are on a dry spell still don't because it's, it's impossible, given, given the size of the encelosphere, anytime the fem cells pop, and this is one of the most amazing things about <laughs> the encelosphere, is anytime a self-avowed fem cell pops in and points out, well, I have a rough time getting sex too, like these guys swarm over, let's meet up, let's meet up right now, right? So these kinds of things, if you're not initiated in these communities, it seems that I'm being one-sided. But the moment you see that just how robust this asymmetry between the sexes and who has the abundance mindset and who has the scarcity mindset as it relates to the opposite gender um, like e even even fem cells self about fem cells they still have the way they interact with the way they interact with male incels it's just so clear that even fem cells have like like a, a man who's simply on a dry spell who may have something of a body count he will still have more of a scarcity mindset as it relates to the opposite gender than will a self-avowed fem cell who has almost as much of an abundance mindset as your, your typical nightlife whore, if I may be crude, which I, I obviously am because this, this is now late in the video. So I just wanted to clean that up. I hope that's clear now. I'm just not going to always paint a picture about how the scenario can be reversed because there's this abundance asymmetry, uh, abundance scarcity asymmetry that's just so widespread across the West based on everything I see. Uh, mostly online, but it carries over to uh, people who are offline as well. Um, it's just the, uh, online, we get the data. So the data can just reinforce what I think anyone who's got you know, eyesight or who can, who can hear what goes on around them, uh, the data will just reinforce that. Someone who simply pays attention to the offline world. Nothing about the data should shock you if you've at all been paying attention to the way people comport themselves, especially across nightlife. Um, but I need to I need to do something else now. What you just finished watching was recorded on December second. It's now December 9th. I have about thirty minutes of stuff from uh, November twenty first, I believe it was. What I recorded on November twenty first, I meant to at the time I was recording it. It was all meant to go up on that last video. Unfortunately, at the time, when I was recording my stuff on November 21st, I didn't realize that the combination of the stuff that I recorded on uh, October 27th and then November 17th, I didn't realize at that time that that was going to total to two hours and 20 minutes. And I'm like, Jesus, do I want to pile on an additional 30 minutes and make that video two hours and 50 minutes? And I decided no. And so I thought that that would be how I would start this video, but it doesn't work. The stuff that I recorded on November 21st should not be the way I start a video. It should be by pointing out that it was, it was, intended, it was intended to go on that video, but I just didn't want to do an extra, an extra 30 minutes when, when the stuff with the October 27th and November 17th was itself. Uh, two hours and 20 minutes. I had no idea that it would total to, to that much. And that's even after I snipped out some stuff. It would have been longer, but I had to snip out some stuff. Nothing major, but maybe just kind of reiterating things. And even with the snips, it ended up being over two hours. So it was like, no way can I tack on 30 minutes of stuff. Uh, but this video, I think, is going to be significantly shorter with the stuff I recorded on December 2nd and the stuff I'm recording now on December 9th. Um, the problem is, I reference... I go into Sam Harris's Twitter a bit more on that recording from November 21st and it seems passe because the day I uploaded that video, uh, the, the, the last video, video titled Androcentric Clown World or, or Clown World is Androcentric, that's the day Sam closed his Twitter. 
and I'm using Sam's Twitter as a kind of springboard for so many other things that are wrong with Twitter, for why anyone would even want to communicate and make any serious argument on Twitter. And so it's just going to seem passe now, because I obviously I didn't know that at the time I was recording that, that three days later, Sam would end up just closing down his Twitter. So just try to ignore the fact that this is a little passe now, and just try to ignore the fact that, um, the, the, again, the, the chronology is all messed up, because I just, I just didn't know that the video would be as long, uh, the, the, the last video. Uh, so just try to ignore the fact that Sam closed the Twitter, which is a good thing. By the way, it's, it's as if, without even me having to upload that, it's like he somehow telepathically heard my frustrations, like, yeah, let's close down Twitter. Obviously, I know that's not it, but it kind of made me, kind of made me think for a split second that, hmm, he may have telepathically heard me. But anyway, um, what's going to come now is roughly 30 minutes of stuff recorded on November 21st, and I'm in the mindset. The reason I'm just qualifying this so much is I'm in a specific kind of mindset where I think that everything you're hearing comes on the heels of that last video after that two hour and 20 minute mark. And that's not the case, but I really want to include it as it is. I don't want to have to kind of redo the rant because then it's just artificial. I want to loop it in as it actually exists. It's roughly 30 minutes. Um, I say a few things that qualify chivalry and then I get into more about this. Uh, like what, what is actually the biggest driver of epistemic dystopia and what is the root cause of the fact that we've, we've never really had an intellectual meritocracy. I, I flesh that out at length and I get really irritated at the end. So I think it's just good. It's a good entertaining, give or take, 30 minutes that I'm going to pile on to this video. Um, but just understand the way I talk assumes that it's a tack on to the last video when it when it's just it's just not so I think that's that's clear enough now um, I've got a lot of things that I, I can add I want to say a few things about Kanye's appearance on Alex Jones uh, specifically things in terms of him talking about his um, uh, addiction to to pornography and then having to sneak in his devout Christianity very much not shying away from politicizing it because it's so, it's so obvious that well, what kind of a role piety, and specifically religious piety, served, right? So here's a guy who's, who's famous, who still got hooked on pornography well over a decade after having been famous, nearly two decades after having been famous. It's so, it's so powerful. Uh, no shortage of actual prospective partners. He's a superstar among superstars, and yet he got hooked on pornography and the way to come out and talk about it and how he viewed it as this negative impact it had on him and his sexual psyche, he didn't use those words, but he had to cloak it in, in, in form of religious piety. And I'm just thinking evolutionarily how this served a specific kind of purpose because absent religious piety, what, what would the average guy, how would the average guy complain about female lewdness and the power female sexuality has over them when they can't simply go out and, and get, get some sexual activity, right? So instead of just fessing to the fact that this is a kind of, just as they use the word sexual empowerment, that, that very much is a true statement, right? It's just anytime it's uttered, no one hears the echoes of social Darwinism in that. A woman who loudly and, and proudly just declares and, and in some way chest pumps that she's out for leverage by way of being scantily clad and that it's, like the term says, it's empowering. But why is it empowering? It's because of guys like Kanye West, right? But see, even a superstar can just admit that this has power over him in a purely uh, secular, materialistic framing. He has to add on a religious, pious framework because it just looks more high-minded that way. Absent that, you just end up looking like you're the sort of guy who can't get any, but who is still distracted by female sexuality, distracted enough to the point where it gets you hooked on pornography, and it's a superstar. This really hasn't been explored, to my knowledge, by historians of, of religious faith or any other kinds of historians of um, pre-modern societies and the Dark Ages and stretching back even further. Um, religious piety, I think, served a specific kind of role 
more so in the case of men, where you can condemn scantily clad <laughs> wardrobes and uh, just just uh, just condemn any kind of willingness to use uh, willingness on the part of women to use their sexuality to gain all kinds of leverage. Um, you can condemn that, and you can cloak it along the lines of this metaphysical extravagance, a la God's will or um, Christ's will or anything like that, right? He kept saying in that interview, Jesus says so or Jesus says no. And that's the black and white binary he's in. Either Jesus says so or Jesus said no. So he doesn't have to feel like a sexual loser and certainly all the non-celeb males who complain about how they're hooked on pornography. They can just appeal to religion to never make themselves, to never present themselves as these sexual losers who just have so much in the way of um, distractibility by way of scantily clad women being just bombarded on them culturally. Um, you can always just point to this pious alternative reason, Jesus says so or Jesus said no, in the case of pornography, in the case of, uh, he used more examples than, than simple pornography. I think he now takes issue with mere promiscuity. And there are reasons to take issue with mere promiscuity the way it exists right now, but not promiscuity per se. Um, but you just always have, by cloaking it in religious terms, you always have plausible deniability that you're not doing it because you just personally can't help having a bunch of scantily clad women empowered to take advantage of your eyesight. You never come across as it's your thirst that's bothering you by cloaking it along the lines of religious piety. Like it's, you always have high-minded, quasi-philosophical religious reasons to want to change that kind of scene into a more modest scene, modest either by way of expression or wardrobe or all these sorts of things. And I'm just wondering if anyone, if, if anyone knows whether anyone has taken a deep dive into this to prove it beyond the kind of speculations that I'm engaging in right now. Has anyone actually connected this? Just as I think the reason religiosity is just so much more prevalent in the U.S., in, in, in the South, where uh, guys just don't express love for each other, like even if they're um, lifelong platonic best friends, they've known each other for decades, and they, and they truly love each other, but they can't really, in some cases, they, they, they can't even hug it out. It's too awkward because the masculinity strictures make it awkward. Um, there's probably some evolutionary reasoning for that. You want to signal from a standpoint of uh, any kind of female that might be observing, you want to signal that you're not gay, so that's why this, we kind of evolved to, to squirm around expressing admiration for our fellow men who we do admire, and maybe not just expressing it through words, but expressing it through things like hugs, right? The reason so many of us are so averse to that, the reason guys don't just hug casually in the West, in the East, they even do that three kiss thing on the cheek. So the East has the opposite problem, they go overboard. But in the West, it's like even, even men hugging, that's very rare from everything I've seen. Um, and it's especially rare in any kind of regional setting where the strictures of masculinity are more tight and tightly enforced. And it's no coincidence, I think, I speculate now that those are also the very areas where um, a religious piety from a, from an organizational and institutional standpoint religious piety has more reach across those populations uh, because in any kind of overtly religious context like in a church men do display both verbally and in terms of gestures and maybe even in terms of hugs uh, when it's protected under when it's kind of God's house once you step into God's house then all these inhibitions can simply go away and you can become disinhibited and you can tell your fellow guy friend that you love them as long as it's within God's house. And you can see how evolutionarily speaking that would play, play up and serve as an outlet for an otherwise repressed male who never really has a chance to you know, just display how much he loves his fellow males in his life. It's no coincidence that it is almost always where I observe the places where Repression is most encouraged, maybe not overtly, but subtly. Repression in terms of men expressing how much they love their fellow male friends. Um, the moment you step into the church, that can go away under the plausible sort of 
makeup of the fact that, oh, God's watching. So once God's watching, it can't be gay once God's watching because this is now a pious circumstance. I think you know what I'm getting with this. And it has, I started thinking about it after I heard Kanye bemoan his pornography problem, but then immediately tie it to Christ. And so just as it has, just as it carries over when it comes to uh, sexual frustration, you're not, you're, you're not bemoaning your own sexual frustrations. You're talking about God's will and what God, how God wants women to behave and how he wants women not to behave. Uh, just as it has some import there, I also think it has import in the context of these male camaraderie, just how much, even just simple gestures of love, males can express for each other. Um, has anyone done any actual work on this to show that this is not a mere strong correlation and that it's causally, that this, this is one of the reasons why religion has thrived for so long is because in God's house, which is a church or a mosque or a synagogue, in God's house, you can let loose a little and display your emotions for your fellow men, uh, whereas outside of God's house, you can't. And it's always in these church attendants, it's always higher in these regions where guys just do repress more of these things. And, and I'm not saying I don't repress it. I'm not saying I'm so high and mighty, but I'll talk more about how I'm not so high and mighty in, in future videos. This is just something I'm throwing at the wall now and seeing like, has anyone actually, I guess a sociologist is someone who may also um, investigate this rigorously um, from a wide reaching longitudinal survey style standpoint, like a global longitudinal survey style standpoint. Uh, if anyone knows of those works, I would be very interested to know. Uh, but apart from that, I think I'm just going to cut it short now. Uh, just quickly, I got to tack this on. I just watched it back. I didn't hang on a very important thing. And as a result of not hanging on it, the whole, the whole segment, the December 9th segment, it's still December 9th, but now the whole December 9th segment, it seems like I'm giving flack to the Kanye, the, the yay type of guy who is addicted to pornography and the very different the, the very many incarnations of Ye, the, the non-famous incarnations of Ye, where that sort of thing is a lot more potent and, and life-destroying in some cases. And I'm pointing out that religion is just, it's just false pretenses. Christ said so versus Christ said no. That's just the false pretenses as to why you, it's, it's a problem that you're hooked on this sort of stuff. Um, it just crowds out in your mind. It crowds out actual reasons that you have to really get to the bottom of what's happening here, right? Um, I hung on that a lot. At one point, very briefly, I said, the echoes of social Darwinism in reference to the woman who rhetorically or very much behaviorally <laughs> spouts this or acts this out, this sexual empowerment stuff. Because the, the word power is right there, right? And so then, then I moved back on to talking about the, the way it impacts guys, because I'm, I'm keeping it androcentric, but we can very much take it beyond that and just think about like actual non-religious reasons to be condemnatory toward this sort of stuff. And, and religion just gets in the way because people do the push-pull thing. So they assume that nearly all of the reasons are gonna be religious or the ones that aren't religious uh, they, they never take it to the social Darwinism angle. They just they think that, okay, so there's some guys who are not religious who want to be possessive of women. And that's the only possible reason you might have to take issue with female sexual empowerment. It's like, no, it has nothing to do with religiosity or with possessiveness. Just as I can, to this day, I'm 100% stand by all my views in terms of prostitution. It should not be over-regulated, much less abolished, much less kept um, any of these um, halfway measures like decrim, so you arrest the pimps, but you don't arrest the hookers. Like, no, 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 it's just full on legal. I stand by all those videos all these years later. The thing that I'm simply going to point out here by connecting a term like sexual empowerment and pointing out to you how really you should be able to hear the echoes of social Darwinism in that. Um, the sort of woman who understands that there's a lot of male thirst out there to be distinct from horniness. I'll get into those distinctions later. So it's not just that there's a lot of male horniness out there. There's, there's a lot of male thirst. It's like, you're going to tell me that a woman who sees that empathizes with it, therefore dresses modestly in the interest of empathizing with it and acting out her empathy in the world. 
Like, I'm not supposed to think that that woman is more admirable than the sort of woman who doesn't and who therefore exploits it and who is content with having orbiters and who is content with uh, maybe helping things like nuclear rejections go viral, not just happen in a crowded setting offline, but actually making it go viral. It's like, absolutely not. You don't have to be a re religious tard and you don't have to be a possessive man to understand that there are echoes of social Darwinism in this and that the woman who says no, I will not do it because it is unfair to all the men who are plagued by their thirst and again, distinct from horniness, which I'll get into at some point later uh, and, and the sort of woman who on those grounds chooses to not be scantily clad because she's not just thinking gynocentrically, she's also thinking androcentrically and in terms of impartiality and who can step outside herself and who doesn't lack imagination. Um, I'm, I'm not supposed to think that that woman is more admirable than the sort of woman who capitalizes on all these innate advantages. There absolutely is a comparison to be made toward the sort of man who capitalizes on his brute strength advantages to assault women or intimidate women or do all these other ghastly sorts of things. There's very much a connection here. It's just there's, there's the, these different types of angles you can take based on the type of gender you are. And so religiosity will just crowd out by condemning female sexuality and female promiscuity on the textbook scripture grounds. It'll just crowd out these actual reasons we have to view the sort of woman who says, no, there's a lot of male thirst out there and I'm going to make it easier on them by not shoving my TNA in their face, by not being yet another woman who's gonna shove her TNA into their face, right? If, if you just can't see how it doesn't take possessiveness or religious dogma to understand that that sort of woman is more admirable than the sort of woman who does the polar opposite of that, I'd like to debate you, because I think that's a debate you'll lose. And so I didn't, I didn't really make that clear, because I, I briefly pointed out echoes of social Darwinism and that I didn't hang on it, having watched it back, now I see it. And so I just want to um, make it more glaring and just kind of pound it a bit more before moving on to the, um, the, the final stage, which is those last 30 minutes recorded on November, November 21st. Um, absolutely. This, these these tradcon-ish tendencies, a lot of tradcons are plainly possessive of women. A lot of tradcons really do want the submissive or overly compliant woman, right? Not denying that, this is why tradcons are so at ease with standard religious faith, is because religious faith is, is very much compatible with that. The kind of religious ordained society is very much compatible with that. But you don't have to touch those views with a 50-foot pole or anything like that in order to see that certain types of women are more admirable than others. They shouldn't be made, they shouldn't be forced to be admirable, this is, it wouldn't be admirable that way, right? If they only did it because they're caving to these tradcon society modesty pressures. No, they're only admirable in the kind of society we have right now, where all the, there's a, there's a tidal wave of social pressure that's telling them to join that sort of train, and yet they still choose not to do it, because they have a wider imagination. They can step outside themselves, it's not the majority of women, based on everything I'm seeing, but I haven't surveyed it from the standpoint of statistics. Uh, it doesn't appear to be the majority of women. The majority of women are very much fine, and more than fine, in terms of capitalizing on the sort of leverage they have, based on these just innate um, sexual dimorphism uh, uh, splinters across the, across the two genders. And so we should foster that kind of environment, because that's the best way you can vet character, is where she's not going to suffer socially. Right? She's not going to suffer, in, in, in really, in, in any way, because so many of these possible counter-criticisms um, of sexual empowerment, they can just easily associate with religious piety or with this possessiveness thing. Uh, and, and there's very few people like me who can actually get on camera and articulate how you can have other reasons, but the moment you step outside the push-pull nonsense, you can have other reasons that completely transcend the way the discourse is typically held. A compassionate woman who doesn't ever head uh, shoved up her own ass will see just how much truly pathetic thirst exists when even Kanye can get addicted to pornography. And there's just so many men like Kanye, non-famous incarnations of Kanye. So at, I would use the word like admirable, but maybe someone would want to say that's too strong a term to say that women who capitalize on their sexuality are necessarily not admirable. 
If you want to go with that, then I would say a backup term can be at least something like considerate, right? The women who are mindful of just the amount of men who get trapped into these sorts of thirst traps, and, and even it can be lifestyle distorting, um, at minimum, you should be able to say these are the kinds of women who are more considerate. And especially if they're attractive and understand that they can get a lot of things. They can, they can go from even easy mode to like tutorial mode if they simply take that kind of path of least resistance by having their TNA and um, just displayed out in public or online or stuff like that. But they choose not to do it because they're compassionate and understanding and they don't have to be the thirsty male who can't get any to realize that it's, it's, it's not fun to be a thirsty male who can't get any, right? There's at least some women who are mindful of these things and it doesn't take a possessive man or a dogmatically religious man to give him kudos for it. It just takes a gender egalitarian, if we're gonna use the word like egalitarianism, who understands that while male plight is funny and thus while the thirsty male is funny, that doesn't have to actually impact our analytical judgments as to whether this is something that is uh, good or, or neutral or, or bad. It, it, it very much is bad. If it afflicts Kanye, who has no shortage of prospective mates and who still gets hooked, can you just imagine the extent to which it, it, it afflicts all the non-famous incarnations of Yay, I shouldn't say Kanye, I should do him the courtesy of calling him by his preferred new name. But, uh, so yeah, I just wanted to tidy all that up. Um, and, and people, like, people might, might be able to agree with me in the moment when, we, when they hear me segment all these things, decouple all these things. But I think even the most attentive listeners, when just enough minutes pass after this, after they hear me end this point, like, they will still acclimate back to that, oh, this is ultimately about possessiveness. <laughs> it's like, it's not just that I'm neutral on possessiveness. I am against male possessiveness of women because that'll always inhibit women to the point where they're not going to do the right thing for the right reasons. <laughs> they're only going to do the right thing and dress modestly and not take advantage of male thirst uh, simply because they know there'll be a bunch of androcentric pressure and, and indeed patriarchal pressure raining down on them. They might do the right things then as a result of that, but they're gonna do it for the wrong reasons. And I wanna foster a culture just like I went at length in the first video. The first video, No Country for Based Men. We should try to foster a culture that has this sweet spot where not just women, but both men and women in these gendered contexts do the right thing for the right reasons, right? Like, even if there was no Violence Against Women Act, um, or even if it was just still perfectly normal and, and the state was supposed to just completely keep out of any of these domestic um, violence situations, um, it still would be the case that a, a wife beater would be someone that we, we take issue with, right? And in the, in the case of domestic abuse, it's a little harder to, make, to draw a clear comparison because then the harm is really that potent. But on some level, at least, on some level, it would be more revealing of uh, the, the character of abusers if we had a culture that didn't taboo physical abuse of women at the hands of men. Because you gotta, you got to believe that at there's at least some men right now who a part of them want to do it, but they don't because they're afraid of the ramifications. So it's just harder. I'm saying on the whole it's good that there's a Violence Against Women Act. That's still good, but just understand th th there's a lot of propensity for abuse that we'll never see. That we'll never see the light of day. Not the act itself, but just the propensity because it's so culturally condemned. And that's a cost. I'm not saying it's a cost that outweighs the benefits of something like Violence Against Women Act, but it's a cost. Um, but the, the best way to see that we still view male adversity in this comedic way, and we can't de decouple that comedic verdict with the actual analytical verdict, is the idea of there being a violence against Manlet's Act is struck down on arrival for no reason other than the fact that violence against Manlet's Act is something that sounds very funny. And that gets us to big chivalry, and so I'll just, I'll just let the November 21st recordings proceed from here on out. But yeah, I just have to clarify all this. It's like I'm, I'm very tough on the guys, 
in these, in what you just saw up until now, but the, the other, the, the, the big takeaway is religion crowds out actual reasons you have, in the case of male camaraderie and male sexual frustration, to pay attention to what's going on, and likewise, religiosity crowds out actual reasons that women might think exist. Many more women would definitely think exist for why they shouldn't be scantily clad, knowing that they're just capitalizing on, on dimorphic differences and guys being in bad situations through no fault of their own. God, it's a vicious loop. It's November 21st now, and I feel I need to addend the November 17th, all the things I said there, just like the November 17th one is my addendum of the October 27th thing, and this can, this can just end up spiraling off into it, and it's just me making another three plus hour video. So I, I have to make this short, rapid fire, but there are at least a couple of things that I said on November 17th that you just finished watching that I can't, I can't save for the next video. The first of those is, is big chivalry. God, what is and isn't chivalry? Like, I can't talk about chivalry and not give a fleshed out overview of what is and isn't. I can't just assume that the definition is something everyone's going agree, to agree with, right? But this is very late into the video. So all I'm going to do now is point out what it is not. How certain things that might seem chivalrous aren't. When you're asked to lift certain objects or, or open certain things and it's very easy to read into that a willingness to be chivalrous whereas it's it's just a willingness to be helpful like if you have a friend a, a platonic friendship a male friend who's a who's a manlet or maybe a turbo manlet and he just consistently fails to lift certain things like uh, to put in the water cooler water on top of the thing um, the, the the jug and so he asks you to do it or whatever he asks you to open various bottles or things of that sort, bottle tops, y you, can, you can do that, there's no, the, the relationship is not going from platonic to more than platonic simply because of your willingness to help your turbo manlet friend out. Um, and so likewise I would say that, that just as that can be true in intergender contexts, sorry, intragender contexts, it can also be true in intergender contexts. You can be helpful without being chivalrous, Opening things and lifting things are, are two examples. There's probably more, but I'm going to have to think about it. And yeah, if, if, if I discuss chivalry, I really should do a fleshed out overview of, of what is and isn't, because maybe I'm assuming too much. Maybe I'm assuming that it's more obvious than it, than it really is to, to, to most people. Um, and it's, it's very easy to read chivalry into things that aren't necessarily chivalrous. And yeah, partly it's what's going on in your mind. Like you might have a, a confluence of motivations. You might want to do it because you want to be helpful, but also there's the, the bad aspects of your mind, the, the vagina brain aspects of your mind. They're also getting some sort of pleasure at the same time uh, along the lines of chivalry. So you, you know your minds better than I do. Uh, but these, these two examples, the baseline is if it works in platonic context and makes sense in platonic context, it can be extended to these inter intergender contexts. And so I, I know I'm, it's, a, it's a bit of a shortcut that I reference chivalry so many times, but I, I, didn't, I didn't give a fleshed out view of all the behaviors. And it is behavioral and, and attitudinal. Um, so yeah, I'll probably do that in the third installment. Uh, the second thing is that when I, when I talked about uh, censorship and what's worse, being ignored or, or being censored, Obviously, being ignored consistently leads to, let's, let's suppose you, you're an activist type and you want to push your agenda, you want the recruitment, uh, and you've never been censored, but you're just consistently ignored. Um, whereas someone who is very much in your position, who gets censored, it is only by being censored that they get a bit of a foot in the door in the way of attention and in the way of actually persuading people because of things like the Streisand effect. Right? That makes it so clear, at least to anyone who's willing to push their views, that being censored can be better than simply being ignored. And I'm just going to read out a comment response. The whole thread is irrelevant. I'm just going to read out my response. I just left this comment before turning on the camera, and it energized me because I realized by leaving this comment, I realized that the thing I said very early on when I compared censorship to being ignored, I didn't use the most important thing to really lambast the people who don't think about it in terms of 
the best, most sensible, most reasonable, and sometimes even most knowledgeable voices being the ones who are most likely to be ignored and never censored and to have their voices and their views not spread simply because they're ignored. I didn't use the best term for that. And the best term is a term I used in the first gender installment video, and that is Just World. This is very much a kind of Just World edging, where they almost, in the back of their minds, believe that, well, people who are ignored, there must be a reason for that. So they're just not bringing good arguments to the table, right? There must be a Just World functioning here. But anyway, I'm going to read this comment, and then I'm going to wrap it up, hopefully, I can't turn this into another hour plus thing because then I'm just going to have another three hour video on my hands. But I am really increasingly stuck in this. This is a kind of a long, long ranging problem on this channel now. I record, maybe I watch it right away, maybe I watch it several days or weeks later. But then after I watch it, I'm like, oh, I got to clean at least a few of these things up. But I know what's going to happen. After I finish this, I'm going to turn it on, maybe right away maybe a few days later, and I'm just going to feel the need to indent even more. So it's like, it's really hard. It's really hard to just feel that I've said everything that needs to be said, to watch it, to be satisfied with it, and then not to do additional commentary. This is getting harder for me. So I understand that there's some amount of question begging to what I've said here that will not be covered. I fully understand that. I just, I just don't want another three-hour video on, on my hands. Um, so this, this is in context to Elon Musk, so I write, uh, He's hot air in every sense. I briefly rant about it in an upcoming video, which I need to finish. Uh, media and outsiders who ape their tactics, that is, media and the very much people who are hostile to media, who ape the tactics of textbook media. Uh, media and outsiders who ape their tactics are obsessed with Twitter for the reasons long-winded, philosophically literate figures who challenge non-hotly contested, often apolitical, irrationalities are routinely ignored. You can't get a communal buzz off of their approach. The landscape they bring to the table is not prefixed. Few things are predictable. Predictability, by the way, this is departing from the common, predictability is my biggest pet peeve. Like, if you churn out this predictable content, if some news event happens, and you're the sort of pundit or talking head, I can just predict what line you're going to take on it. It doesn't matter whether I agree with you or not. Far more obnoxious to me is just how predictable, the predictability index. Because it's all just meant to, to play to the plebs. Because the, the plebs aren't bothered by predictability. The plebs are solely bothered by whether you are, whether or not you are placating their priors. And far more people need to be picking up on this and shaming the plebs. The landscape isn't prefixed. Few things are predictable. Ghouls using loaded language on prefixed issues, on the other hand, is very much the reverse story of that. We need to start calling these people ghouls. They're some of the worst ghouls. Because they've sniffed out what their base likes, and they'll throw red meat to the base, and it's very easy to do. It's very lucrative. And I've made all these noises before, but just like I said, that all the issues that I remarked on in the October 27th recording worsened when I did my November 20, uh, November 17th recording. Here I am, um, November 21st, and I just again mistakenly I made the mistake of popping on onto Sam Harris's Twitter, and he's he's debating these. We need to keep Trump off Twitter because because he's a dangerous figure. This is about harm prevention from him. I lambast that in my post, Dissident Speech and Freedom of Reach. I just I just completely go go after him on that because it's nowhere near as predictable. But the point is, it's nowhere near as predictable in advance, right? It's always it's always hindsight bias. What's going to be unacceptably harmful in advance? So you can't even use censorship, even corporate censorship. As, as this <laughs> roundabout, long-ranging tool of harm prevention. It only seems clear in terms of hindsight bias. So that's my, that's my three strikes and you're out, Sam, thing that you can read at length in that post. But the point is, he should know never to argue these topics on Twitter because Twitter is it's where long-winded commentary goes to die. Even if you split your tweets up, people who want to do long, 
ranging commentary on Twitter, so they split their tweets up. You look like, it's called Twitter threads, and you look at these Twitter threads, like the stuff in the middle gets far more retweets, likes, reactions, than the very stuff at the top, and in a few cases, the very stuff at the end of the thread. So it's like, your long-windedness will not be read. People will read just the very first, maybe two or three threads, and then it just plummets. The engagement with the Twitter thread ones, even if you go as few as 10 separate tweets to, be a, to have a long-ranging kind of rant, even when there's as few as 10, I've seen people go on like 50 separate tweets. Then it really drops off in the middle and even towards the end when your Twitter thread is, like, comprises of 50 different tweets. But like even if you go as few as 10, the, the, the engagement drops off in the middle. So Twitter really is the hallmark of bite-sized commentary. And Sam is coming in. These are all loaded subjects. He knows people are going to use loaded language against him. He's using loaded language in some cases, pretending that this is not about hindsight bias. And so it's just people using loaded language against each other in these bite-sized commentaries. All it does is just is it, it allows people to entrench themselves in their priors. It's so bad. It's so bad. And, and Sam's always kind of the go-to person I go to check to see what he's tweeted last. So I know I reference him often, but like I cannot believe he thinks that it makes sense to make any of these arguments on that platform. So anyway. Um, a rational activist should prefer to be censored when the alternative is being consistently ignored, and we're being ignored despite being onto something is the worst thing one can be in terms of pushing one's agenda slash ideological recruitment. Denial of this amounts to just world edging. This is what I should have said way back when I started talking about this in the in the previous installment on, on the 17th. It's so just world edging. Because they if their heads explode when one of their people gets censored, not when they get censored. I understand the individual who gets censored, that being really obnoxious, because you presumably put in some work to edit a video, to think about what you're going to say in advance, and then you turn on the camera and you articulate it all in a really good way, something I'm probably not doing well right now because I'm a little too hyper, uh, because I want to wrap this up. But uh, yeah, my, my video familial reductionism, that's the, that's the gaping hole video. It got wiped out. I was really on fire in that video, and I'm annoyed at the censorship on those grounds. I'm not annoyed because I think now that the tectonic plates of the internet are going to look different than they otherwise would have had that video stayed on. It's not about the te tectonic plates of the internet. No, it's about, I was on fucking fire in that video, and I want that video to be a part of my fucking channel. But it got removed. I wasn't even given a clear-cut reason. So I understand all these subjective reasons to find censorship and the terms of service extremely appalling. But to think you have high-minded, objective reasons to say that, like, the more censorship we have, the more we're going to be on this epistemic downfall. Like, you're just, just world edging. That's all you're doing. You're assuming that all these people who are ignored without being censored, you may not put it into these words, but you are assuming that all these people who are persistently ignored without being censored, usually philosopher types, I'm not talking about myself here, I'm way too disorganized to lump myself into this category, but there are really organized thinkers who put their thoughts into books or into speeches, into seminars, and they're just, they never even make a dent. They're far more rational than your typical person who's newsy. And yet, this outrage, this kind of, pseudo high-minded outrage over censorship feigns this I, I, I'm not gonna say it's performative outrage but if it's not performative if it's earnest then it's just that they're not paying adequate attention to all the people who never get censored who can make an impact because their arguments force you to think their arguments are very challenging their, their arguments take more of your time to truly absorb this is not cognitive ease this is cognitive strain and you ought to think about the topic of censorship in terms of cognitive ease versus cognitive strain is more predictive, is more coextensive of whether or not we're in a epistemic downfall or an epistemic revolution. The more people indulge in, in, in cognitive ease, the less we're going to be on the path to, to, a, to a true intellectual meritocracy. But you have to believe that it is to some extent meritocratic if your head explodes when one of your favorite commentators 
get something of their censored or, or even shadow banned. You have to believe that that besmirches the pre-existing meritocracy. And the only way you can do that is by failing to see how many people are more rational and more sensible than that commentator of yours who got censored, who, who never get censored, simply because they're not even a blip on the radar. Because people indulge in cognitive ease. The path of least resistance, my, my video, my irritation index, I go off on the path of least resistance. Rewatch that video for fuck's sakes. Anyway, denial of this amounts to just world edging. It's why I lump everyone debating censorship with such intensity into the epistemic cripple camp. They don't see all the figures who've never been censored, who argue far better, and who are simply ignored decade after decade. Very plebish. Why are the best so often ignored? Communal vibes. Then in parentheses I put uh, kind of a, a, a cinematic analogy. Uh, everyone's going to see this blockbuster. I cannot not see it. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to over the years who, it's like, they're not interested in the genre of the particular movie that is now the blockbuster. They're not interested in any of the actors. The director is not their cup of tea. The screenwriters are not their cup of tea. But they still go, they, they dish out good cash to see a movie simply because it's a blockbuster. Because they get these communal vibes off of being able to talk about what everyone else is talking about. This is what destroys intellectual meritocracy on the internet, I think, more than anything else. It serves these pre-epistemic communal needs. These newsy spaces, you have to understand that. The reason so many people are energized over this, they don't see it, but it serves these communal needs to talk about the thing that they know everyone else is already talking about. Even though the things have been discussed into the ground a billion times over. Whereas actual interesting subjects that, um, well, I'm not going to get into them now because then I'm just going to tangent off of into them, but there's so many interesting subjects that all these newsy people who, like, like Andrew Sullivan, I pop into Andrew Sullivan's Twitter once every once in a blue moon, and it's just it's just the same. It's just fucking Groundhog Day, and he never pays a price. He never pays a price for it because people like that predictable pre-existing landscape. They need it because it serves these communal vibes when you're in that kind of familiar territory, and when you know who's gonna come out in favor of what and who's gonna come out against what. Like seriously, everyone watching this video just. You probably never pay attention to anything Andrew Sullivan says to begin with, but just do this as an exercise. Do this as a favor to me. Once a month, mark one day out of the calendar and just pop into his Twitter and see what he tweets about in this very kind of, oh, I'm so angry at the people who are not reporting on things the way I would report on things if I were a media insider. I'm now a media outsider. I plug my Substack, and I'm so angry at the people who are playing these silly intellectually dishonest games in these radical politics games like this is one of the people who thinks that the biggest thing that ails us is the lack of moderation and the optic in extremism from every which way but extremism is a very it's one of these weasel words like what was what was extreme a few decades ago is moderate now what was um yeah decades is fine maybe centuries is the better term to put for it but i think american politics uh, American political culture changes with such a rapid pace that I don't even need to say centuries anymore. I can just say decades. Uh, but, but as a favor to me, once a month, mark one month on the calendar. It doesn't matter. Mark one day on the calendar. It doesn't matter what day that is. And just check a few dozen tweets from Andrew Sullivan once a month. And you will see how much of a replica that man is of whatever he did the previous month. It's so interchangeable put Brett Weinstein on that list. I'll put, I'll put the vast majority of well-known tweeters on that list. Even people I, I, really, I really do agree with. I'll put Timothy Snyder on that list. I'll put Ann Applebaum on that list. It's just, they're not bothered by their predictability and, and their hobby horsing. And they need to be bothered. True, <laughs> philosophically literate people will be bothered by that sort of stuff. They'll make different arguments as the time goes on. Even if their arguments didn't pick up steam the first time, they're not just gonna drill those arguments into the ground day in and day out because they're not obsessed with boosterism. All these people are obsessed with boosterism. When you're obsessed with boosterism, wave goodbye to intellectual meritocracy. You're just playing on the fact that this very well-known fact reported in psychology, well replicated, the fact that 
repetition works. Repetition is persuasive. Against the backdrop of that, how could you possibly expect to be taken seriously when it is the very people who get sucked into this tactic of perpetual repetition who every now and then get censored? It's like, they shouldn't be censored, but I'm not going to come out here and say that I'll fight to the death. That is performative, by the way. Anyone who says, I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. It's like, no, no, no. There's a lot of other better things I can do with my time than to lose my mind over the fact that very lazy, mentally lazy, probably financially opportunistic people get censored. There's a billion other problems in the world that I'll pay attention to and get outraged about than that. The only way you can convince yourself that it's worth being outraged about is if you actually believe that it's more or less an intellectual meritocracy as it exists and the sole breaker of that meritocracy is the censorship. No! It is mental laziness and it is this communal need to talk about the things everyone else is talking about and that leads you astray and it pisses me the fuck off and I'm tired of it and I'm tired of people not thinking about it and not feeling challenged by the sort of things that I'm saying right now. Where did I leave off? See, you know it's, you know it's bad when I don't even know where I left off. Um, they don't see all the figures who've never been censored, who argue far better, and who are simply ignored decade after decade. Very plebish. Why are the best so often ignored? Communal vibes. Okay, I did read this part out. Uh, everyone's going to see this blockbuster. I cannot not see it. And the ease of being on familiar ground. You can't sloganeer when you're in the deep end. This all serves social needs. It can be purely recreational. Oftentimes it's partly financial too. Anyone plugging their Patreon, their Substack. Uh, it's no coincidence that these are the spaces where loaded language gets used the most freely. Mental laziness and communal thirst contribute far more to epistemic disarray than censorship does. Though it's not this way in every society, notably in past societies, but today, on the internet, laziness and bias surrounding people's priors and the need for them to flatter their own priors damages perspective far more than the existence of the babyish terms of service on here and elsewhere. Inhabitants of newsy spaces haven't begun to wrap their minds around that, so I spit on there, I'll defend to the death, you're right to say it, performative regurgitations. And then I say, Elon Musk is quickly crawling to the top of that list. So, ev evidently, I'm tired of this not being something that all these people who intensely debate censorship feel that they need to address. Because what underlies it is what underlies so many other things that blind people to, to rationality and, and, and truth. And that is the, the just world belief. In this case, it's not all out just world belief, but it, it is a kind of just world edging. If you feel you're wronged because your favorite people are censored, but you never feel wrong when some of your favorite people are simply ignored. Oh, that's right. You haven't paid attention to the landscape for long enough to actually have some of your favorite people be the very people who are ignored. But if you do, if you're one of the people who has both people you pay attention to and agree with, and you want to see them reign supreme from an epistemic standpoint, and it never bothers you when they're ignored and when they fail to boost their agenda that way, and it only bothers you when they're censored, I just invite you to think long and hard about the possibility that this is a kind of just world edging. You are assuming, you are assuming a kind of meritocracy here that simply doesn't exist. And therefore, it is only the hand of man that can make it, that can lessen its staying power by way of censorship. The hand of the man in the kind of, in, in the corporate suit, let's say. No. Mental laziness should be on your shit list, far above censorship. Right, so I also, I knew I was forgetting something, I also said I would read this post. I'm not going to read it, but it will be the first thing I'm going to link, so you can easily access it. I just, I just think the way I wrote up what I wrote up in response to this, the Joker tried to warn you video, I think this is about as good as a framing device to discuss what's wrong for in, from every which angle what's wrong if something gets enough steam 
to actually make it into the tens of thousands of views count, it has something profoundly wrong with it. And this comment that you're looking at right now that I'm screenshotting that I will link to as a community post, the very first thing I'll link to, I think it's the best antidote that explains it, it may be too long winded away. I don't know. I just, it's the first thing I'm going to link. I encourage you to make use of this. I don't care if you just copy and paste it verbatim when you run across someone who takes the angle of this YouTuber. The, the, the Joker tried to warn you as somehow they've got, they're thinking rationally about male issues. They're not. They're very much on the side of, uh, it's, it's more Mistow than, than Mictow. Uh, even though in this comment, I don't use words like MGTOW, I don't use words like MISTOW as the replacement for it, but I explain what I explain, so just read it if you have the time, and feel free to, to, to make use of it, to spread it, to copy and paste it verbatim, or shorten it if you think it's, it's too long-winded, but as I start out at the very beginning, the elephant of the room here is the tenuous relationship between the will and the mind. Much more to be said on the will and the mind, in the next video, I'm going to take it back to the way Schopenhauer wrote about it. I have audios that I still haven't utilized from that first installment of the trilogy. Just because if, if I had included all those audios, then that first video would have been way over three hours. But yeah, I need to, I need to figure out where or whether to even include those audios. Because I, I didn't lump all the audios from way back on October 10th that I that I recorded. I, I, I didn't make use of those, like half of those audios yet. I only used, I only used the latter half. So, um, this is what I think is a good, almost way to deprogram people from the, the lazy way in which they think about these issues. Cause they think the renegade commentary is what this uploader does is everything this uploader says in this video. I'll link to the video itself. I'll link to both my community posts and I'll link to the stupid video he did. But um, it's, it's, it's not the sensible commentary because he just completely sidesteps the issue of the, of the will and the mind. Um, so yeah, that's probably the first thing I'm going to link. I have a lot of things to link to and I, I just have to think about the, the title of this video too. I think in no other example do I have so many candidate titles competing for, for supremacy because um, titles are part of... You know, I also have these... See, now, now, now I'm making this even longer, but I, not only do I have, do I increasingly think of, like, what's a good snappy title, because I have so many, so many things that I come up with, uh, but I also increasingly think of, like, how to present the information, because I'm just so attuned to the psychological literature, which says, like, your arguments can be just completely identical, but the order in which you present them can be a difference maker in terms of whether or not the person you need to persuade is persuaded. Just the chronology of the arguments, how they're presented. Like sometimes the most controversial argument, if you start off with it, that can surprisingly be the best way to go. And the less controversial things that are put at the end, that's uh, how it should be ordered. And, and really, it, it depends on the issue. So I'm just thinking about all these things and I'm annoyed at the fact that I'm the only one who seems to be grappling with these things. Like all these other people who just present their stuff, they just blurt it all out, even though they must on some level be aware that the, the chronology of the information is important. And I'm just, I'm just annoyed at how I overthink everything and, and no one else seems to. But also, I think it's a matter of me having OCD. Uh, yeah, I, th I think my OCD is acting up more, more so than, than normal. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the pot. It's making my OCD worse, but it's still, on the whole, it's still worth it. Because, um, yeah, even even after I recorded this last thing, it's still November 21st, by the way. I recorded that, I went out to grab some coffee, and as I'm walking back, I'm thinking, oh, mention this as your addendum to the third addendum. Like, I had these two specific things. I'm like, mention this. You cannot finish this video without mentioning this as well. And I'm like, okay, well, make a note quickly so you remember what to say specifically. And I'm like, no, you don't need to. You'll remember the things you, you need to say in your very final addendum, your, your audio-only addendum that overlooks the, the, the comment that you said you were going to read, but you won't. I'm like, make a note of the two things. Like, no, 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 you'll remember. Well, guess what? Now I'm recording the audio for the final overlooking of the comment screenshot, and I forgot what those two things were. And so I'm like, well, 
at least if you reference the fact that you forgot it, then it'll be decent enough. Like, why would that even matter if I reference in the audio that I wanted to say two other things, but I forgot what they are? So it'll be good because maybe you can garner some sympathy about your OCD. I'm like, why am I looking for sympathy? <laughs> like, who the fuck would care that I have these OCD issues? Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty. I had two other things that I really wanted to include, and that was just based on watching this recording that I did just two hours ago. It's still the twenty first, and I'm like, you need to lump two other things at the end of this recording, two other specific points, unique points that no one else makes. It's like, yeah, I'll remember what they are. I don't need to make a note. It's like, no, I should have made the goddamn note. So. Whatever those two things are that are really pertinent to the issue, that round out the issue really well, uh, I'll, I'll just make in the next video. But I just, I just need to announce the fact that there, there are these two things that actually do buttress all the other things I said in this, in this last recording. Uh, but, but this is a comment that I highly, I highly urge everyone to just copy and paste somewhere in your notepad. And if you come across a mindless person, usually a vagina brain person, who may think that they need to defend big chivalry or defend things that are adjacent to big chivalry, see how they respond when you, if you want to copy and paste it word for word, that's fine. If you want to shorten it, that's fine. See what they say to everything I've written here. Seven minutes, almost seven minutes. Let's wait.